Good to see so many of you back. Uh, I've been learning, uh, writing about actually evangelism in the last few weeks. I'm, I'm ghostwriting a book for uh, a pastor in the outside Chicago area who has uh, a fantastic church. It has 7,000 people in it right now. But the unique thing about his church is that he's baptized 5,000 of those people in the last 30 years. So, uh, you know, a lot of the big churches these days are big because, uh, because you know, their music program is better than everybody else's. And so they suck off of all the other churches and everybody switches and goes to their church. But uh, real church growth happens when people get saved and they get excited. And they start telling their neighbors, and their neighbors tell their neighbors, and things start to uh, multiply. And so that's that's been exciting. So uh, one of the things one of the things I wrote uh, about was uh, remembering a, a a book from um, about evangelism by Robert Coleman, Master Plan of Evangelism. I read years ago, and uh, fantastic statement. He says that that the uh, the real mark of evangelism is uh, not the number of com converts at the end of, of the meeting, but the work of Christ in the next generation. That's the real mark of evangelism. Because real evangelism is discipleship. It's following Christ. Becoming a follower of Christ and leading others in following Christ. It's not just saving people. You know, that's the first step. But uh, we, we have words like this. You know, we, we talk about, well, Jesus is, is Savior, but He's not Lord yet. You know, and and I, I don't even know what that means. How, how, how can you know Jesus and He's not Lord? You know, and, or, or that you are saved and then you rededicate your life to Christ. Um, as a, in other words, I get saved and then I decide whether I'm going to really mean this or not, kind of thing. And uh, to me, what I'm discovering is that the mark of the fact that you have been saved is that you are now following Christ with everything you got. That's that's what you're into this for. And so uh, I was thinking that as well, we could also say that the, the mark of true Discipleship are all the people who come at 8.30 on Sunday morning to week two. <laughs> so it's a long way around to get to my punchline, but um, hopefully you've got a little something in the process. Well, um, week one, uh, we kind of kicked this whole idea of New Covenant open with discovering that the Apostle Paul uh, walked through right by an opportunity that the Lord had opened up a door for him uh, for the Gospel. But he walked by that door and went somewhere else. Does anybody remember why he did that? Pardon? Yeah, he was... He was Concerned about Titus, so what could we say about his own state at that time? He was anxious. He was, uh, uh, his human condition prevented him at that point from obeying God. In a sense, you could say, that's what it says. The Lord opened a door for me. It personally opened a door for Paul that he did not go through because of the anxiety in his spirit. Um, an amazing passage that I think a lot of us gloss over because we're not used to seeing our, our great biblical heroes being so honest and being so true about their own human condition and their own human struggle. Um, my wife has put together actually a wonderful uh, study um, 
on this whole passage. It's a study guide with questions. We put a little time into it. I wanted to actually ask you if we were able to make that available to you. Something you could take home and you could probably spend, you know, anywhere from 15 minutes to, to more if you really get excited about it um, in between classes going over some questions. How many would, would take advantage of that if, if we were able to? Very cool. Well, let's talk about that. Um, Don, can we, we make that possible? I, I, and my wife is, is so good at this. In fact, she will be here one of these mornings. And I will probably not get through my whole talk because she will stand up and at some point say, so what? Because that's who she is. She's the so what when it comes to the scriptures and teaching. Because she's all concerned about what does this mean to my life right now? And, uh, you know, I, and I love to pontificate. You know, I love to get intellectual. I, I love to see the Word of God be true and make sense and put stuff together. But, you know, you can get all excited about that and then just walk away and nothing, absolutely, absolutely nothing has happened to you. You, you have not, you haven't changed anything. And that's, that's what my wife is all, all concerned about. And, uh, for instance, in this section, she has these kind of questions. Briefly, identify a time when you worked and worked on something only to see it begin to fall apart. That ever happened to you? Worked and worked on something. Paul had these plans. He had this thing that was going to happen. And it fell apart. How did you feel? What did you do? Try to make what was wrong right? Stood frozen? Became sick to your stomach? What? <laughs> What did you do? Do you think you could have shared as honestly as Paul did about his frustration and sick to his stomach anxiousness, so much so that he skipped a booked date in the marketplace consisting of a huge group of people looking for life's answers? Would you have been able to be as honest as Paul? And how can he reverse his position so quickly Nothing is going well for Paul, and yet at the same time, he is throwing a New York ticker tape parade as if the war had been won. And that's exactly where we get to in our passage today as we move on. I'm anxious in my spirit. I missed an opportunity. But here's this little three-letter word that is a huge word in this whole passage. We'll see it two or three times. What's that word? The little three-letter word? But. 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 Absolutely. As a matter of fact, look, um, look further. You can see this, 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 ver this word in, uh, if you have your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 16. But. Their minds were, were, remain hard, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. We're going to find out what that means. But there's a turning point. The but is the turning point. And then the biggest one of all is in chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. There's a contrast. The new covenant is all about Contrast. It's a study in contrasts. And the point of the New Covenant is not to hide our, the things that contrast in our life, but to actually make a point of them. God is going to make a point of the contrasts in our life. God is going to make a point of our weakness, of our struggle, of our anxiety, of our human nature. He's going to make a point of that because he wants to make a point about his power that is evident in the midst of our humanity. That's his whole point. And when you and I hide that contrast, we end up hiding the power of God. 
This is probably the hardest thing for us to discover is that, is that God wants us to be real. Remember I shared with you last week that I had that little time with, with the Lord in College Church in Wheaton and told him I would follow him and do whatever he said as long as it was real. Well, he answered that question in this passage. Because not only did he say it's okay to be real, he's telling us you have to be real if you want to be powerful. If you want the power of God in your life, then you have to be who you really are. Because that's the way the world will discover me. They will not discover me when they see you trying to be a good Christian. Trying to be good Christians never works. As a matter of fact, it ends up hiding the power of God. Being who we are, going through whatever we happen to be going through, that's when the power of God shows up. So the but is so important it's the contrast. It's our weakness, our human limitations, our anxiety or fear set up against God's power. That's the way He's going to make a change in the world through you and I. What do we usually do about our human limitations? our weaknesses or our anxiety, especially in a Christian context. What do we usually do? We hide it. We cover it up. You know, there's this idea we've gotten that, that Christians are supposed to have it all together. And so we all try to have it all together. And in the end, if that is truly what we're doing, we are hiding the power of God. Because the power of God is made perfect in our weakness. Over and over, Paul has so many different ways of approaching this and saying this. But that's his whole point. Is when we're truly real, is when God can use us. And that's why this but in, in uh, verse 14 is so important. But thanks be to God. who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Him everywhere. But thanks be to God. I love uh, Marty's comment here about the New York ticker, ticker tape parade. That's really the idea. Paul is actually referring here to something that the people in Corinth would have immediately recognized because it's something that happens over and over again in their town, in their community because the, the procession is a, is a victory parade. This is the time of the Roman Empire and when new barbarian lands were conquered then the, uh, the conquering soldiers would return home and there was a Ticker tape parade. And the people in the parade were the soldiers, but in the back, there were the captives that they brought to be slaves in chains. And they came as captives, and there was incense burning, and there was rejoicing, and all kinds of celebration because of the victory. And that celebration had an effect on the whole town. And Paul uses that as a picture, amazingly, of, of you and I. And it's interesting that he doesn't put us as the conquering soldiers, he puts us as the captives. Did you notice that? He puts us as the, as, as the captives, the ones who are captive to Christ. We have, we have given up our own rights and our own authority to ourselves. And we are totally given over to the Lord. We are serving Him. We are His captives. As Paul says, I'm a slave of Christ. That's, that's who I am. We're not the conquering soldiers. We're the slaves of Jesus. And 
There's a fragrance that happens in this parade, and that fragrance puts off a reaction among people. Before we're going to talk about that fragrance this morning, but before we get there, there's a, another aspect that we need to talk about first. And it's another word that's key. We talked about how, how key that three-letter word is, but thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Him everywhere. It's that word, always. That's another key word to this passage. Paul is so confident that God is always leading us. Now, what makes this stand out is the context. The context was something that appears to be a failure on Paul's part. And yet, in the midst of that, he can turn right around and say, thanks be to God who always leads us. In other words, are you telling me, Paul, that God is leading you even in your missing of this opportunity? God is leading you in that? Well, yes, that's exactly what he says. God is either leading us or he's not. And his point, and this is the point of the new covenant, the overwhelming thing is that God is always saying something in your life. He is always using you. Whether you are aware of it, whether you are in on the program, whether you are, you know, going the opposite direction, <laughs> He's still going to use you. Darn it! You can't get away from this. See? It's kind of like, you know, once, once you get on board with Christ, you, you're on the train, and the train's going in the right direction. Now, you can, you can start going to the back of the train, but you're still going in the right direction. You might not be, you know, where you could be on the train, but God's still in control of your life, and He's taking you to a destination, and He's going to use you, even the parts that don't seem to be His will or don't seem to work or seem to be against what good Christians would do. God uses that. He uses pain. He uses accidents. He uses diseases. He uses even sin or rebellion. He uses all those things. It's either always or it's not. And if it says it's always, then it is always. He always leads us. He always makes an impact. Probably one of the greatest illustrations of this, I can tell you, is remember I told you last week about my experience at Mount Hermon um, up in the Bay Area. After my uh, senior year, I think I contrasted that two summers that I had. The first summer was 1968, before, I, before I, my senior year in college. And remember I was a youth director at the main camp? And remember I shared how frustrated I was that whole summer? Because I was trying to do what I thought a youth director was supposed to do. And as far as I was concerned, I was a failure. I, was, I know that by the end of the summer I was exhausted. Because I had worked so hard. And remember I shared what happened the next year at, at the same camp in a similar type of situation, a completely different experience happened because this time I was simply trusting in God. I didn't have all these expectations on myself. I just showed up. It's all I could do. I had had a brand new experience with, with God. In many ways, I think perhaps I really got saved at that point. I don't know when I... How do you know when you get saved? Yeah, some people know. It's dramatic. Some people grow up with this, you know? And it just kind of slowly begins to happen, but the light goes on, and when did it start? I, I'm not really sure. 
I don't care because I know I'm saved now and I plan to be saved tomorrow because I'm going to keep believing. Okay? I'm not sure exactly when it, when it all began, but there was a major turning point in my life between those two summers. And the second, the second summer I went back, I knew my limitations, I knew my, my, my weaknesses, and, and yet I was discovering this thing called the Spirit of God that I didn't even know ex existed before that. And I didn't know it, 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 that He was a real element in my life, and that He actually wanted to work in a real way through myself and my relationship. And so I just showed up and began to discover, my gosh, this is true. The Holy Spirit does work in our lives and lead us to the right kinds of people and the right things to say. Here's the thing. That first summer sounds to me like it was a, a, a waste of time. It was a lost summer for me. For me, it might have been. I don't know. But if this is true, He's always leading us in triumph. Do you think that, that I might have had an impact that first summer too on those kids? What do you think? Absolutely. And in fact, the Lord gave me a little, little story for this. Because there's, there's a guy today who writes me all the time. Is, we have this uh, website. And we have a number of people, I, I think I shared with you, that I, I write a daily devotional. Um, by the way, please get on board. It's, uh, the easiest way to remember it is fishtank.com. But uh, don't forget the C, because my name has a C in it. So you have to spell fish, F-I-S-C-H. Okay? But if you spell fish and then tank, T-A-N-K, like a think tank, dot com, you'll get there. Okay? And you can sign up. There's a button right there. Sign up and put your email address and you'll hear something fresh from me every morning that I probably wrote about an hour before I uh, posted it. Okay. And it's a very exciting community we have going here. And we're going to start doing a lot of different things in that community. Well, one of these people that surfaced from our com community is a guy named Joe Saubert, who was at that camp. Uh, the first year at, at my failure camp you know what he says that was a turning point in his life he is and, and he is just so thrilled he just thinks the sun rises and sets on me <laughs> now as long as he wants to believe that that's fine you know, it, it, it's, it's the Lord how did that happen well, it happened because the Lord is always leading us in triumph, even when we're not getting it. Okay? And, and I, I'm so glad that the Lord gave me that little window on that summer before. Because that is probably a better example of any of what the new covenant truly is. It's God working through us. And many times in spite of us. We're going to all be blown away when we get to heaven and we find out how God used us in ways we never even knew. The only reason I found out about Joe is that he found out about my website and he wrote me and told me. How many other people haven't written me and haven't told me what happened when they, you know, had this class or that class or that experience? or this song, or that song, and what it meant to them. You know, I'm con I, I, I hear stuff like this, and I, I'm so far removed from it, I, because I didn't do that. I didn't do anything. I, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just carrying on my life, trying to do the best I know, and trusting that God is working through me. Okay? But if there's anything lasting, it's going to be that part. It's going to be the part that God did in and through my life. And that's the same way He works in and through you. Always. He's always leading us in a, in a parade, in a public display. Okay, knowing this, this is not a new thought, especially for Christians. I, I grew up, I told you, I grew up in an evangelical environment. 
We heard all the time that our life was on display. And that people were going to be watching us. That's when they told us, that, you know, junior high kids. You know, you, people are watching you. They're going, to, they're going to know Jesus through your life. So you better get your together. You know? <laughs> because you are it. You know, you're the, you're the one. And so that all only just made us try harder. And that's the kind of Christianity that I think so many people are caught up in. It's what I call Avis Christianity. We try harder. Oh, we're trying harder, we try harder, we get frustrated. Because we're just working on it ourselves. We're trying so hard to make this thing happen. And to me, that's the wrong way to take this parade thing. This idea that you're on display doesn't mean... See, the end result of that was that actually we became very good at our image. Remember that? illustration I had and everyone was kind of in the middle part of the pedestal and then there's just all this, the rest of the part was their image. That's what we all work on. We all work on the image part. What we want to project about who we are. And when God is working with us down here, where we really are. And that's where He wants us to live. And that's where He wants us to have fellowship where we really are. And that's where He wants to use us where we really are. So the idea of being on a parade and being on display does not mean that you and I are supposed to put our best foot for, for, forward. And that's the way we've approached this probably most of our Christian life. That would be the wrong way to take this, especially in context. You can see in context. That's really can be what Paul is saying here. What he's really saying is the right way is to be real and to be who you are. To be real to be who you are. Not only did I get my, my answer from God about I just want this to be real if I follow you, I found out that that's the only way it can be. That's the only way it works is when you're real. And like Paul, you're able to share everything about your life, even the mistakes and the failures and walking by open doors. Why? Okay. Why? He goes on to say why. The thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us, He uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Him everywhere. Okay, so everywhere you go, there's an aroma. A kind of spiritual B.O. if you want, if you have it. You know? <laughs> The aroma is not because your life is all together. But the aroma is because Christ is in you. That's why. No matter what's going on, Christ is in you. Because He goes to exactly define what it is. We are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. These prepositions are really important. So let me read this again, and then I'm going to ask you to pull some of these out for me, okay? For we are, to God, the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Now, if you're a good English student, you know there are three important prepositions there. Of, to, and among. <laughs> right? And they're very important. Okay. So, what those do is tell us what the aroma is and what it does in three prepositions. So, let me ask you, what is the aroma? He describes it right here. What is the aroma? We are the aroma of what? Of Christ. So, what is the aroma? Christ. It's not us trying, it's Christ. The aroma is Christ in us. Okay, now here's the next question. This is kind of interesting. Because it's two and a month. So we got we got a couple things going on here. You have to answer the question then, 
Who is the aroma for? Primarily, primarily, who is it for? To God. We are the aroma to God. Okay? Aroma to God. We haven't even brought it. We haven't even brought up anybody yet. <laughs> it's just you and God. Wow. How important is worship? How important is your vertical communication with the Lord of glory? What's, what's the whole point? As far as God is concerned, He looks out and He sees you and me and He is pleased. He made us for this. And if that's all the farther it goes, He's happy about that. Because He made you in His image. He made you to contain Him and to have fellowship with. We are aroma to Christ. That you're just, it's an amazing thought that your Christian life is first and foremost for God. Have you ever thought of that? It's first and foremost for God. He wants to have this relationship with us. We're that important to Him. And that's why He made us all so different with different faces and different bodies and different personalities and different languages. Different nationalities and ethnic groups. We're all different because all together we give off this glory of God on the earth. This alone that's for Him. First and foremost, we are Christians for God. That, that's enough to fill up a, a week right there. I mean, you, you, could, you could really stop there and put a lot of thought in it, don't you think? Because I'm not sure we really think like that very much. That you and I exist for God. Remember, remember when Jesus was baptized, baptized by John? And, and remember the voice spoke from heaven? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The thing I love about that is that Jesus hadn't done anything yet. He hadn't even begun His ministry yet. And He was already pleasing to His Father. And I truly believe that that's true for us. That we are already pleasing to the Lord before we ever do anything. We, before we ever succeed or fail or whatever, we are pleasing to God because we put off in a room. He longs to have a relationship with us. That's why He made us. And so we are first and foremost an aroma to God. The second, the last preposition we said was among. And so we're aroma to God among who? People people, and then he actually divides people into two groups. He divides them into those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Okay? So, we're in a Roman of Christ to God among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Let me just ask you, what do you have to do with that? It doesn't sound like you have a whole lot to do with that yet. Does it? I mean, do you think this is a fragrance that you put on or take off? Do you put it on in the morning? You wash it off at night? Or is it just there? It's there, isn't it? I mean, I honestly think we can't do anything about it. Because we believe. Because the Holy Spirit has been born in us. Okay? So, that's, that's there. You don't... You don't put it on and you don't take it off. You have it in Christ. And, and yet, you are going to divide a room because of that fragrance. Because some people will be drawn to it and some people will be repelled by it. Are you in control of that? No. 
If, if your life in Christ drives someone away from you, is there anything you can do about that? Yeah. I, you know, you can run after him, I says. I, I don't know, but I don't think so. I don't think there's a whole lot you can do about that. Except be who you are. And pour your life into those who are drawn to you. Because they come to you, there's something that they are. Something agrees with their, their spirit, that, what they're seeking. They're, 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 they're smelling the life of Christ in you. They want to be a part of that. Okay? And that's what he wants us to be in, involved with him. There's, so there's a, there's a primary and a secondary reason for this aroma. The, the primary is to God. The secondary is to, to among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Fragrance of life, fragrance of death. I got a new insight into this. I've been teaching this for years and years. I got a new insight into it this morning, about 15 minutes ago, as I was going over my notes. Because I started to think about this in a new way. So let me ask you another question. As far as Jesus was concerned, who, let's, let's look at Jesus. That's the fragrance, right? So if we look at Jesus himself when he was here, we might be able to learn something about this, right? So to who was Jesus a fragrance of life? What type of people was Jesus a fragrance of life? Can you explain some of those people to me? Who were they? The lost. Who else? The least. Prostitutes. Tax collectors. Sinners. Publicans. Curious. Sick. What a group. Those that needed, the needy ones. Jesus was the light to the needy ones. Let me ask you this. This is going to be a shock. Who was he a death to? Who was Jesus a death to? The Pharisee. All the religious people. Do we have religious Christians today? Well, a lot of them. You know, I, I, I think that's a new insight that I didn't even have. I used to think, well, this is just, you know, Christians and non-Christians. But I think it's, I think it may even be something else. The fragrance of Christ is death to those who are trying. Because it, 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 it blows apart their scheme. Jesus blew apart the Pharisees' whole thing. They couldn't keep doing it. They couldn't keep measuring each other. And Jesus came and he put the thing on a whole new level. He was always trying to show the Pharisees how bad they were. Really, he was. Because they didn't think they were so bad. They were comparing themselves with everybody else and coming off looking pretty good. And that's why this, the whole Sermon on the Mount was for the Pharisees, for the religious people, to show them what the truth really is. Because you remember he says over and over again in that sermon, you've heard it said, but I say to you. For instance, you have heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, if you have lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. Or you've heard it said, don't murder, don't kill. But I say to you, if you have hatred in your heart towards someone, you just kill them. And over and over again. You've heard it said, love, you know, love, I say love your enemies. Oh, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I say to you, Turn the other cheek. Don't, don't react. God will have His vengeance. You turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. Somebody takes you. He wants to take your shirt. Give him your coat too. Wow. What is he doing? He's blowing apart the Pharisees' scheme. 
And he was death to the Pharisees, and that's why they killed him. And the new covenant is death to anybody who is living in the old covenant. That's who it's death to. It's death to those who are trying. And it's life to the weak and the sinners and the prostitutes. And the... What group do you want to be in? <laughs> huh? I'm, I'm just getting more and more comfortable being in the group with all the bad people. I, I just... <laughs> I like that because I've spent so much of my life trying to be with all the good people. And it doesn't work. And it's much better to be with the bad people because then you're just thankful. Then you're just overwhelmed all the time. And you're constantly astonished about God's grace. And you can't believe you got saved. And that makes it a lot easier to share the good news with other people too. Because you're just like one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. You're just with these people all the time. You see the sinner and you are no different. You see your sin when you see the sinner. You don't judge him. There's not an ounce of judgment in your heart because you know how awful you are. How can you possibly judge someone else when you know how awful you are? And then when you know that in your awfulness, God has found you and loved you and forgave you and put His grace on you, well, then you want to just tell anybody and everybody. That's life. That's where the life comes. And so we were fragrance to those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Life to the lost. Death to, to those who think they got it okay. They're going to be okay. They're not really grasping on to their own sin and their own weaknesses. Oh my, it's time to quit. Um, that's the nice thing about a 12-week series, is that we've got next week. So we will pick up right here, because there's a wonderful picture at the end of this chapter of, um, of that takes this picture, all, pulls it all together in terms of Paul. Uh, but let's, let me just at least read it for you. Uh, so we can put a, put a cap on our clothes here. To the one where an aroma to life that brings life, to the other an aroma that brings death, and who is equal to such a task? That's a huge question. We're going to answer that question probably not even next week because Paul doesn't answer it until chapter 3, about halfway through. It's a rhetorical question. Who can pull this off? He's, he's asking it on purpose to try and say, well, not me. I mean, that's the obvious, the obvious answer. He wants us to have that answer. Because he wants us to get to the point where we realize it's not me, but it's God. Who is equal to this task? Who can pull this off? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent, sent from God. We stand before God. We are completely sincere. We are not hucksters. We don't, we don't sell you something. We are who we are. And who we are is the secret to making this thing work in the world today. And that's what we're going to go into. We're going to go into finding why, and we're going into finding why you are equal to the task. Because that's the ultimate answer. You are, but on what basis are you? That's what we're going to learn next. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for how encouraging these words are to us. How so many of us have worked so hard to try and be good Christians. And suddenly we find out that 
that you were working through us all the time. And that that's the key. is not what we do for you, but what you do in and through us. Help us to know how to incorporate that into our lives, how to get into your program. We want to, we want to be on, we, we're on the train, but we just want to go in the same direction that you're going. Show us how to do that. I ask this in your name. Amen.